Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is July 10th, 2020. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Happy Friday to you guys. Um, you've joined uh, joined us for the CAF COVID Weekly Roundup. We're going to cover a bunch of different things today. Um, and luckily for us, we don't have a bunch of AFLs to talk about, um, but uh, we do have some some kind of uh, best practices to go over when it comes to the barriers, environmental controls, and then we'll talk about the testing of the delays and stuff like that. Um, my name is Jason Belden. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness for the California Association of Health Facilities. Um, CAF has a grant-funded disaster preparedness program. Uh, both Courtney and myself work for that disaster preparedness program, and uh, we have a ton of uh, resources, both on the CAF.org website uh, under coronavirus, um, but also under the CAF disaster prep uh, website. And on that website, you can find many more best practices, not just for coronavirus, but for all types of disaster and emergency preparedness topics. So. Uh, no, normally we have guest speakers, but uh, today, the, uh, thank goodness, the regulatory uh, uh, kind of stuff that came out this week is very minimal, so um, uh, Patty's not going to be joining us, and Jeff Sandman, uh, our Director of Reimbursement, has given me a one-page update, and I listened to a webinar that they gave earlier this week that I thought I was going to try to... Um, truncate and put on to uh, this webinar, but frankly, it's way too dense. I'm just going to cover some of the topics and then point you to where you can uh, watch the webinar. So in any case, that's what we've got going on for today. Um, there was one AFL, not necessarily uh, regulatory in nature or um, something that you guys weren't unprepared for, but the uh, license fee schedule has been released and that's currently up on the uh, CDPH website if you're interested in it. I always look at those things and I go, why is it again that Los Angeles gets an extra fee? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I look at that thing. So um, anyways, uh, I want to jump right into the uh, kind of soup du jour because I've gotten tons of emails on this in in the past week. And, and I know we covered it to some extent last week. Uh, I've finally gotten an official position from both the the chief life safety officer for Oshpod, as well as the actual director of the department. So um, these are the official positions of Oshpod, and then we'll talk about some of the best practices that they suggest. So if you're in a facility and you've determined that the facility's best chance of uh, containing uh, COVID would be to construct uh, plastic barriers that divide up the physical space in between your cohort categories. Uh, you can do that. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily required, except for I believe the Los Angeles County Public Health Department wants to see these plastic barriers installed. That's the only county I'm seeing where the local public health department is actually asking people to set them up. And then, uh, of course, I've also got letters that people that had set them up need to tear them down. So there's not a lot of consistency even within the, their own department in the county. But whether you do it or you don't do it, there's there's pretty much just one way that Oshpod wants to see this done. And uh, the good news is it's not particularly difficult or won't take you very much time to do it. Uh, the question is whether the products you've already purchased to do this plastic material uh, or these plastic barriers meets the requirement. And that's more, probably more where we're, we're gonna be concerned. So the first thing we need to do, if we have this set up, um, that we need to have signage on both sides of the plastic sheeting that says tear down in case of emergency. Uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned on the webinars before how as, especially as an ex-firefighter, it's uh, it's the thing that we consider sacred in a building is, is the hallways and the means of egress. And when we lose a means of egress, it means we lose the building. And, and it's really difficult for a firefighter or somebody to come in to save folks' life if the means of egress is compromised. And uh, and so when when I talk about this, understand that I look at it from that perspective. Uh, and so my suggestion is if it's not, um, if you've gotten together with your 
you know, your maintenance staff, your uh, um, clinical staff, and you've talked about, can we keep folks divided from these spaces without using the barriers? Is a visual indication enough? And then in those ca cases, maybe that works better for you. And I certainly think it works better for life safety, but if you have local health telling you they want you to do this and you're okay with doing that, um, you know you don't have to fight it you can you can do these three steps and we can make sure it's uh it's going to be okay so we've got the signage on the plastic barrier now we're going to do an in-service for all staff in the building and we're going to tell them in case of a fire or an emergency if the fire alarm goes off the closest staff member to that barrier is going to take the the barrier down um, so that means when we set the barrier up, it has to be able to be removed pretty quickly. So, you know, don't permanently attach it to the building. It's It's got to be something that can be taken down very quickly. And then the, the last bullet point is uh, when it's located in a fire rated corridor. And, and just so you know, in the means of egress is a fire rated corridor. Now, if you're doing these plastic materials in other uh, parts of the building, I still think this is best practice. You you would want to at least get the plastic material that has the flame retardant um, already applied to it. So um, if you really want some really dense dry reading, you can click on the Office of State Fire Marshal's guidelines for the retardant that needs to be applied to this fabric or, or plastic. It's incredibly uh, dense, it's 80 pages. You could read it and still have questions. So my suggestion uh, would be to you guys, well, I'll get a, into how you can, you know, what you can, um, how you can get that product. It's pretty easy and I'll go over that in a second. So, and I just wanted to put this language because this came right from the director. So the director of Oshpot says, no one disputes the need to take any and all appropriate actions uh, to perfect both your patients and staff. Um, they go on to say plastic sheeting can't um, block or prohibit fire sprinklers from activating. So a good rule of thumb is it needs a minimum of four inches of clearance away from a sprinkler head. So when you set these up, don't set them up next to um, a sprinkler head because it could affect the flow of the sprinkler head if it, if it activates. Um, and just know those sprinkler heads don't activate um, very easily. It takes a pretty high temperature for them uh, to get them to activate. And so one of the best practices that they have identified that if for some reason this plastic barrier itself catches on fire, they, um, it's not going to flame like you think a, a piece of paper would. What it will do is it will melt. But when it melts, it lets off a kind of a toxic smoke. And and uh, the quicker we can put um, uh, uh, extinguish that with a portable fire extinguisher, the better, because that smoke is very much more harmful than just regular combustibles that are that are burning. So we want to, you know, when we do our in service and you uh, you talk to people about their past, you know, have them concentrate on make sure that they understand we're going to put the fire out on the barrier first. Um, so with that being said, you want to make sure that portable fire extinguishers are in close proximity to that pl plastic sheeting. Um, you know, I, you don't have to set it on the ground, but at least uh, identify where it is. When you do your in-service uh, to your staff, point them to where the nearest uh, fire extinguishers are. And then this is kind of going a, uh, a above and beyond and that's to provide a fire watch. Uh, traditionally this would be required if we were going to compromise the means of egress but I think Oshpot understands that given the current circumstances we may not have free staff to pull away from care activities. If that is the case then fire watch is going to have to be modified but if you want to know how to do fire watch Oshpot has what they call a policy intent notice and it talks about the requirements that are required to do fire watch. Uh, you could do a Google search for Oshpot Poly Policy Intent Notice number 14, and that'll give you the PDF version of the requirement. All right, so other considerations. Now, this is not a, a requirement, but will be best practice, especially because we know, um, well, the second bullet point here is a requirement. You're going to need to contact your Oshpot compliance officer 
and let them know uh, that you have a barrier up and that you're following those that guidance that uh, Paul Coleman, the director of uh, OSHPOD, as well as um, uh, Nancy Timmons, the chief life safety officer. Um, both of those folks have given us this direction. So you're gonna let the compliance number officer know you're meeting the guidelines that they set forth. You're gonna take a picture of your compliance because I think we're not gonna have these folks in our building um, unless there's something strange going on that requires uh, OSHPOD to physically come view it. But we've given been given indication that mostly this is gonna be done over the phone. You're gonna call the compliance officer. You're gonna explain to them that you're compliant with the requirements as you understand them. And as a best practice, I would take uh, pictures of the labels of the products you're purchasing to meet that, as well as the signage that you've put on either side. Um, if you're wondering who your your uh, compliance officer is for OSHPOD, you can, um, this link here at the bottom for construction finance facility detail is a is a list of all the facilities in the state. And if you, on the, you know, the first part of the link, if you just start typing in the name of your facility, it will pull it up. It'll tell you the name and phone number of your compliance officer, your regional compliance officer, and all that other stuff. And so we talked, uh, you know, and it'll give you your OSHPOD um, uh, facility number as well, because uh, the compliance officer will also need to know that as well. Um, and we talked last week a little bit about, we were unsure of what kind of um, barriers would qualify under the state fire marshal requirements. And the, the chief gave me a great piece of advice. Just do a Google search for Visqueen fire resistant barrier. And you're gonna, uh, you're gonna come up with dozens of choices um, uh, for purchase. But we wanna make sure it meets those fire resistant barrier requirements. Um, it should come with a, a label or some kind of documentation a data sheet for the product that says the state, this meets the California State Fire Marshal Requirements or CSFM requirements for flame spread rating. Um, I looked at a bunch of different products there. You can purchase them from most of the traditional vendors that you see in our space. I don't want to mention them by name uh, in case I forget somebody and I don't, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, put one person in front of the other. But if you do a Google search, you're going to find uh, a number of uh, providers uh, that sell those uh, products. All right. Um, hopefully that puts to bed the barrier um, requirements. But if you guys have, um, they've really given us indication that Oshpot is is wants to work collaboratively with you guys to minimize the impact on operations and to minimize the requirements to do unnecessary or burdensome paperwork during this time. So if that turns out to not be the case, please let us know. I, you know, there's a lot of things maybe we can't solve, but I'm happy to at least call and say, you know, that's not the experience these folks are feeling. And, and maybe it's an individual compliance officer that's having issues. Maybe it's a regional compliance officer that's having issues. Um, or giving folks uh, difficulty, but we we need to know about that. And and I promise you that the director and the chief and all of the leadership at Oshpod uh, is uh, committed to making sure that you know, they don't hinder our ability uh, to provide safe care. Uh, they only want to support that, and that's kind of why those uh, those those kind of three things are are you know those three requirements are are going to be required of you guys. All right, I wanna talk about some more best practice stuff. I don't know how much you guys consume of COVID-related uh, education and other materials that's not provided by uh, government entities. Uh, sadly, in this thing, we get so reactionary um, that we have very little time to actually think forward and uh, and start talking about maybe Maybe we don't know all we think we know about this uh, this virus, and so in the in the in the lack of, of really dense AFLs coming out, we've been able to spend some time reviewing research that's being done not just in the United States but all over the world, and um, we've run into uh, you know situations where coalitions or collaborations or researchers in other parts of the world have indicated. 
a much more viable airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 than, um, than the United States and uh, certainly folks in our state have been have been leading us to believe. And we, we've seen outbreaks, not just in um, nursing homes, but also in hospitals, also in other uh, venues where it seems to be that the facility, the skilled nursing facility or the acute hospital was at least doing a passing job of, of, of following the infection control uh, guidance. And uh, that gives us a level of concern um, with universal source control and, and, and thinking that is a panacea. Um, when we had those Cal OSHA folks um, uh, speak a few weeks ago, they talked about environmental controls being the number one thing we could do to reduce uh, the risk of any kind of um, exposure to not just our staff, but also to the residents. When we think about having a, if you had a fire, you know, if, if something catches on fire in your building, you don't move people to, you just don't take people out of that room and move them to another part of the building. You remove them from the building altogether. And that's an, an environmental control. We're move, removing the risk. We're either removing the rim, risk from the building or we're re removing us from the risk. And, and in this COVID, because we don't, because every element of healthcare is impacted, the ability for us to move people, massive amounts of people, is really difficult. And so we have to think about what are the environmental controls that we can do within our facility that minimize uh, the exposure risk. And I just want to give you a, a, a little kind of sentence as to some of the research um, or some of the, the voices that are what they're saying about this. So during the rapid ri rise of COVID-19 illness and deaths globally, notwithstanding recommended precaution, questions are voiced about routes of transmission for this pandemic disease. It is apparent that inhaling small airborne droplets is probable as a third route of infection. And so that just means that you know, I'm 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 stating what you guys probably think is obvious now, but um, but when they talk about airborne particles, they're not talking about particles that can be blocked by surgical masks. They're talking about small airborne particles that may that the surgical mask may not be effective at controlling, and um, and that's really scary when we think about it. So. We know surgical masks are not 100% effective. If they were, you know, they would be used as uh, PPE and rather as, rather than source control. So we know they're not 100% effective. And how do we how do we prevent this? Especially when we know our staff is out in the community, they're going to the grocery store, they're getting it. I know you guys in other parts of state, uh, the state are now seeing it, but this is. It's almost like deja vu because we're seeing a lot of um, smaller communities now struggle with the same things that uh, you know Los Angeles County struggled with and Riverside in the early parts of this, as well as uh, you know some of the counties in the Bay Area. So if um, we know that it's going to come to you, I don't think it's uh, realistic to think that this uh, it's not going to affect your building in some way. I think before this is over, we'll all have some uh, impact, hopefully less, uh, you know, than it has been. But I don't know that that's a a realistic plan. Um, I'll say that you know when we flatten, when they talk about flattening the curve, they didn't talk about breaking the curve. They talked about flattening it so that it could reduce the impact on the healthcare system. And, um, but as they, you know, once they get to a point where the healthcare system's overwhelmed, then they may back down on it. But um, I think the plan is, uh, you know, to kind of maintain uh, so that we don't get into a surge in healthcare, but it also doesn't mean that community transmission is gonna stop or, not, or stop increasing, because it's, it's going to increase into our communities. Um, one of the things that the recommendations, um, we'll, we'll go over the recommendations that the research is showing, what you should do to uh, minimize the risk anyways. Um, we know that large re respiratory droplets and direct contact is still considered the primary source, but 
when it comes to air and airflow, and I know I've mentioned this a bunch of times, but if you guys have your, uh, you need to, if you're not talking to your maintenance staff, you need to find out right now today, are we, are our HVAC systems set up to recirculate air? I'm hopeful they're not, um, but when it comes to summertime, and we're we're about to have a, a heat wave, you know, uh, this weekend, air recirculation helps us keep the building cool, and it's uh, it's much more difficult for us to cool the building when we're constantly pulling in hot fresh air, and uh, and that creates another problem. But the recirculation of air within our buildings. Um, is is probably likely um, to contribute to um, um, contamination into other spaces. So if we're cohorted with positive cases on one side, that air is moving to the other side of the building, and the and the half life of these things does not end in a couple minutes. Um, and so it's it's quite possible that those could be moving from room to room. Um, air cleaning and disinfection devices, uh, are not maybe, but they are beneficial. Um, HEPA filtration has been used in hospitals for a long time. Um, a HEPA filter filters out 0 0.03 microns of uh, whatever it, um, whatever the virus or the uh, the particles are. So uh, it's even more effective, I believe, than an N95 mask. So it's those HEPA filters uh, they do work. I'm not an expert on where you're going to set up the HEPA filter side, but if if um, if you guys have uh, created that um, that space or you have HEPA filters and you have best practices you can share with other providers, this is a collective knowledge. We've got to help each other out with this because it, it, it looks bad on everybody um, if uh, other folks are struggling. And then the last or the first one there is UV. We've long known that UV light works on different kind of contaminants, different kind of viruses. There's some promising new technology. I'll talk about that in a little bit here of what you can do, but there are UVC lights uh, that allow for UV disinfection. Um, some of them have um, short-term benefits and some of them have long-term benefits. Um, and then portable consumer air cleaning devices may also be beneficial. So let's say you don't have the ability to add HEPA filtration to your HVAC system, there are portable uh, HEPA filtration units that can be used. Um, similar to an air scrubber, you know, like you use for, um, if you got outside air that, you know, if you, especially if you've been subject to forest fires and vegetation fires where the air is bad and coming into your building, these are the type of things that we're talking about. Um, if you're considering this or something that you don't have, there are many companies out there that uh, both rent these, and if you're not able to get these, um, now's the time to communicate with your MOAC and say, hey, listen, our, you know, do you have an in with somebody that has uh, portable air, air filtration devices that I can use your uh, connection to rent these or to lease these uh, until the, you know, until the uh, pandemic is over, um, especially if you've got positive cases in the building or. Uh, it, uh, it's definitely going to be helpful. So, um, give me a second here. I get click off the wrong thing. No. Pardon me. All right. So, in, if implemented correctly, um, building related measures will lower the overall uh, environmental concentrations of airborne pathogens. I think that's probably logical or self evident. I want to give you the, the kind of requirements or, or the recommendations uh, they're, they're given. So I've got two links on the bottom here. The very first one is, um, is from uh, Science Direct. I don't have any affiliation with them, nor do I have any experience with them. The only reason I would put, I put this article on here because it was, they drew from numerous different research studies that have been done all over the world, and they've collated them into one thing to build these recommendations. And then uh, SIDREP, which is a Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, um, also has a similar set of recommendations that they put in there. And SIDREP is nationally known as one of the um, premier or uh, primary research uh, functions. They're 
I don't know if you watch the news, but the director of the SIDREP has been on, you know, all the national news programs or was at the beginning of these responses. Um, they started predicting the impact uh, of COVID into the United States back in December. So um, they're, they're as good as it gets when it comes to uh, infectious disease research. So I wanted to uh, just put those two on there so you know I didn't come up with this out of the blue. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to make things up, but I don't want, and I, I'm hesitant to recommend things that the, um, that the CDC or CDPH has not recommended, but we've got to be a step ahead. I, you know, I'm still hearing stories of, uh, large, really, really large outbreaks in, um, in nursing homes, even after folks have followed, or at least they've self-identified that they followed infection prevention guides they've done the screening they've done the universal source control and still they've got 60 positive cases and so there's something there that we're not factoring in um and uh, maybe it's maybe it's us or maybe it's that particular provider but i like to think that there's a combination of a number of different things that contribute to that and we've got to work around the edges with this thing we're not going to take big swings and clear this out or or there's not one piece of advice or or guidance that's going to 100 percent get you through this um so we've got to do um the margins we've got to be effective where we possibly can and be ready to respond once it hits the building because it's going to hit us if we thought it wasn't going to hit us because the community spread seem lower. I don't know if that's realistic. So, um, but those three things they talk about, or the four things they talk about, excuse me, uh, remind and highlight to building managers, your administrators, infection control teams, that engineering controls are effective and they will reduce the risk of airborne infection. It needs to be a equal part of, of what you're doing in terms of minimizing the risk in the building. Uh, you need to, if you can, increase the existing ventilation rates, the outdoor change rate, and enhance ventilation effectiveness. Um, so we we talked about not recirculating the air. Um, that that's the second system. Um, if you are in a building that does not have air conditioning, you're going to look to those um, those portable units, and we definitely want to um, uh, get fresh air in in into the building um all right and uh so the fourth one or the third one sorry to supplement existing ventilation with portable air cleaners we talked about that um uh, where there are areas of known air stagnation um or or um, high risk patients are in uh adequate replacement of the filters needs to be as a part of your maintenance uh maintenance procedures w while you're using those products and the last one the last recommendation is what we're already doing but i just want to re-emphasize we want to avoid any kind of um uh, communal or group um, and this includes staff uh, when you do your stand-ups you're going to have to be creative um, i don't want to call it social distancing i've actually been corrected on that term um, because we don't want to distance socially, we just want physical distancing. So let's let's physically distance to make sure that we're not doing it. If we have outdoor space to be able to do that, that's great. Um, we want to we want to minimize uh, those risks of being within that six foot space. And this is uh, recommended for everybody, not just when you're at work. Uh, it's when you're at home, uh, maybe not with your families. Uh, I don't know that that's realistic. But it, it is realistic to say when we step outside of our house, let's um, let's follow that best practice. Let's encourage our staff to follow that best practice. The risk that they live with outside is um, will be exacerbated when they come to work, and our folks are are particularly vulnerable. So, if you have questions about how to incur, um, you know, how to do these environmental controls. I sent out um, some, I asked for help uh, for, you know, the engineers that work for Oshpod. Uh, they have a, what, what they call a hospital building safety board, which is a, a bunch of members from hospitals 
that we've asked to kind of take a look at this. And if there's guidance or best practice that the hospitals are doing as it relates to ventilation, I realize we cannot do, well, we could set up temporary negative pressure isolation, but most of you guys are not gonna do that. So what are, what are the hospitals doing and is there best practice we can model? As soon as I get that guidance from, um, from Oshpod, I'll post it in, in all the forums we have, and I'll certainly cover it here on the webinar. Um, I just want to touch for a second on surveys. Um, I know that uh, a number of providers in Southern California, and I'm assuming this is going to start uh, state, uh, statewide, um, but they're starting to get unannounced uh, uh, surveys. So they've gone through their original mitigation plan survey. They've gotten that survey approved. And a week later, here comes the surveyor uh, again, or two weeks later, unannounced. Um, now, I ha have not been able to determine if the surveys have any material difference from the first time you went through the survey. Um, but just anticipate that soon, maybe sooner than you think, you're going to get an unannounced survey after your mitigation plan has been approved. So, and then uh, I've talked to, now this has not happened for SNFs, but for ICF providers, I've heard of them uh, beginning life safety surveys as well. I, I've got an email into the chief of the life safety code unit to ask if that is going to, if that's just a local variance, if that's just one particular office, if that's one particular facility, I, I'm not aware of it. This is the first time I've heard of the life safety surveys um, uh, coming in as well. So once we get clearance on that or clarification on that, we'll, we'll definitely cover it. All right, I wanna jump to the testing delays um, because this is a huge, huge problem uh, all over the state. Um, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so one, just as a an awareness or situational awareness for everybody in the state, just know that um, testing delays are happening in multiple counties. Um, and, uh, and when I'm talking about testing delays, I'm talking about the, the testing that you're doing with your local health departments, especially if you've put into your mitigation plan and the plan's been approved, any in your mitigation plan you've identified that the local health department is the one that's either gonna help you with response-driven testing or they're gonna help you with surveillance testing. If that is the case and you're not getting those results back in two to three days, you know, they have, less and less clinical value the longer it takes. And so we need to be proactive and think about, is there a solution that I can do um, that A, is going to give me the same kind of um, ease of use? In other words, they're gonna come do the test, they're gonna pay for the test, they're gonna uh, administer the test, they're going to collate the results and provide it back to us. If you can find somebody else that meets all of those criteria, uh, I would say at least get that resource up and running and ready to go. Now, I've been told that some of the testing task force labs, uh, well, I shouldn't say some, one of the testing task force labs that I am aware of that's located here locally uh, that has told people that they need to pay up front for the test. That is not at all the um, understanding that we had with CDPH and when we asked them for a list of vetted labs and what the procedure would be, our understanding is they will take care of the, the billing in-house. If you get somebody that you pulled off this lab list and said, you know, I'm gonna use this person because this is what the state says and they'll, they're supposed to do it all, and I call them up and, I, and they say it's gonna be $149 per person to do the test. You say, thanks very much, I'll give you a call if I need it. Um, and then move to the next one on the list and then let me know if that's the case uh, or let somebody at CAF know so that we can uh, let CDPH know. Um, that is not, um, that's not helpful. That's, uh, that actually hurts us more because it gives people an unrealistic expectation of what can actually happen in our buildings. Um, but we can't, uh, I realize this is hard. I realize the local health departments are overwhelmed, um, but um, our folks need to be a priority. And if those folks can't make them a priority, 
we have to be their gatekeeper of that. And and that testing will be really important and really impactful in, in uh, helping us learn how you know where it is in our building and how we can protect people we're not going to be able to protect everybody but we can save people we really can by getting uh you know these testing results back quickly so i want i want you to spread your wings and try as many people as you can and um if the local health department cannot help and even if you've got pending test results that are like seven to ten days or some crazy thing like that I want uh, I want you guys first let the district office know say hey I, as a part of my mitigation plan I put that I you know the the uh, local health department is going to help with my response driven testing they came out and did the test and I'm I'm 10 days later I'm still waiting for results um, CDPH is you know it's basically said the pressure um, to do that for the local health departments they're giving them pressure we're giving them pressure. But giving them pressure is not solving the issue. Um, and I'm not sure that CDPH has the ability to kind of force them to do that. So we've got to say, look, if, if you can't meet it, one, don't cite me on my mitigation plan because I put in that the local health department was going to do this type of testing and now they've reneged on the agreement. If, if that's the case, we shouldn't be held responsible for that. So I want you guys to let your district office know change whatever it is in your mitigation plan that needs to be changed and and say look i've got to change my mitigation plan i've got to use this resource instead of that resource and 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 that's what we're going to do um i talked about specific companies on the lab list uh, that were causing issues uh we'll get that and track it but also companies that we have engaged with or that we have already had relationships with so think about your existing lab partner and you just said, hey, listen, can you do COVID testing? And that person said, yes, but they're not, that is not what they're set up to do. They're a traditional lab partner and they're doing it as uh, as an added service. Um, these folks may not have the capacity and I don't wanna besmirch them, but if they're telling, giving you promises about how quickly they can get results back, they're doing you a disservice and they're really doing a disservice to the residents in the building. So ask, if you have a provider that you're working with and that provider is struggling to meet the demand, look at that testing last lab list. It's it's quite all right to keep using them for all your other labs. You don't have to say, look, you, you know, you suck at this. I'm not going to use you. You can't blame them for that because everybody's having difficulties with that. Just say, look, thank you. I'm going to try to get this done in another way. Um, and so. We have also heard of a large lab provider in Southern California pulling out of that space altogether. And so I've talked to many of you guys that have had them as a lab partner. And for those folks I've, I've told to call the lab list, I really, I, I can't encourage you enough because one of the things we asked CDPH was, look, we want a one size fits all testing solution. We want mobile testing that goes to each building and just goes from building to building. You can do it for the community. Why can't you do it here? Uh, that's what was our number one ask. Now, uh, we obviously we weren't successful with that, but we did ask if you are gonna require this at providers and you're gonna require the business community, not the government or not some state agency to fulfill this public health function, then you need to give us a vetted list of labs that can meet the demand and minimize the uh, operational impacts of having to do this. And so that's how we got to the lab list, guys. And uh, and if if you're not using those labs, I, there's no there's really little advocacy I can do to CDPH to get them to get your personal lab to do go quicker or the local health department to go quicker. It has to be done through that lab list. And then once those folks uh, can no longer meet the requirements, then we'll address it when that, we'll jump over that hoop when it comes. Um, but then I can say, look, hey, we told you this task force lab list needed to be vetted, needed to be, you know, factor in all the operational considerations, and it's just not doing it. And that's concrete things I can give to them and say, look, okay, if that's the case, now you've got to look at the all-in-one testing solution because we need to be a priority. So, but I can't do that until 
this other resource has been exhausted or it does not work. So, all right, that's uh, testing delays. I know it's a ton of stuff. I, I'm not gonna go over this stuff because frankly, I would be doing it a disservice if I tried to explain any of this stuff. But if you're an administrator or, or, or somebody that's using CARES Act funding or any of these PPP funds, just know that each, you know, the government doesn't give away money um, without something expected in return. And that expectation is actually very, very high in terms of these uh, tranches of funding. And I, maybe, it's, maybe you're not gonna be the one to learn this, but somebody at your organization is gonna have to have a, an extraordinarily strong understanding of each one of these bullet points to be able to um, justify the expenses of the money and be able to protect you on the back end from audits and things like that. So um, the slides in the webinar that were given, it was a, a number of folks on the, on the webinar. Um, both the slides in the webinar are available on the CAF website. Um, your staff contact for that would be Jeff Sandman or Jennifer Breen. Uh, um, but, you know, Mark Reagan, a, a number of both attorneys and uh, um, accountants, uh, cost preparers, all those folks were represented on that webinar. Um, highly, highly informative. Uh, it'll probably scare you a little bit because you'll think about, God, man, do I really want to deal with all this stuff? But um, it, it, uh, it's very important if, you, if you're using that, that funding source. All right, I talked for, uh, gosh, uh, too long. Um, I, I did talk about the technology solutions when we're doing those environmental controls. I participated in a webinar um, by a, a company that makes a product called Solaris, which is a UV disinfection device. I'm not saying you guys gotta go out and buy this device. They're extraordinarily expensive, um, you know, but as we look at this, um, there may be, uh, if you're looking at spending money, this is uh, certainly a cost that could be uh, counter towards this because it's something you've not um, purchased before and you're doing it right with the, um, you know, because of the COVID. But the good news is the particular technology solution that I watched the webinar on disinfects for more than just COVID. It takes care of C. diff, takes care of uh, Candida auris. Uh, so a number of the other MDROs that we're also concerned about would also be um, effectively killed with this particular techn technology solution. So you can do a Google search. I know uh, one of our, um, our providers sells these uh, or one of our associate members sells these. I, I'm, I'm certain they're not the only person that sells it, but um, uh, but if if you're a Medline uh, um, customer, you could always uh, call Medline and, and talk to them about it. I don't know who else sells it. I just know about the product itself. And I I was I was blown away at the efficacy of of, of using this to kill not just COVID but uh, some of the other things. And if you've heard that call yesterday, it's not it's a it's definitely an area of focus that we've kind of put on the back burner uh, since COVID. But uh, Candida Auris has a really, really high mortality rate as well, and that is in facilities in uh, Southern California. It's been in facilities in the state of Illinois, uh, New York, and New Jersey prior to COVID as well. And there, it's a really nasty uh, virus. And so if this works on that, hey, great. And you can afford to do it, hey, great. Um, boosting your mental health during a crisis. I um, watched a great webinar the other day, um, presented by a professor at UNLV that talked about boosting mental health during a crisis, specific to healthcare workers and folks that are in our position. Um, she had great um, insight as to, you know, kind of the way we feel, the way that we, we do, you know, uh, how our physiological response is different when we're under stressors. It was a fantastic thing. It was so good that I, I gosh, I gotta have this gal on. Uh, she's fantastic. So on the 24th, uh, we'll have her talk. Uh, and I'm telling you, this is, it's really, really good. We're going to have her on the webinar on the 24th. So don't miss that one. Um, but she had some good kind of mental things to think about. And one of them was, uh, we have been in this thing, uh, you know, for so long. And there's, uh, there's kind of a fatigue factor with how long this is 
what this is gone. And just the recognition that this is a marathon, tell yourself it's a marathon, tell yourself you're gonna be okay and we're gonna get through this, cause we are, we're gonna get through this. You guys are gonna do this and you really are. I promise you, I've had folks that administrators that have been impacted by this early uh, and heavily, they made it through this, they got their staff through this, they got their residents through this. Um, you're gonna get those folks through it, but it's not a sprint. So take your breath, you know, just concentrate on your breathing, get through today, accept the next challenge and just move forward. Um, I, I really do. If you're starting to feel like, man, this is getting insane, just try to calm your breathing down and, and understand you're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay, guys. Uh, testing delays, like I, I said before, we, we really need you guys to uh, track which companies you're using, and if they're a part of that lab list, give it to us so we can address it with the state directly. And the one last piece of information, uh, this is more of a, a best practice that I uh, like to do, or Courtney, likes, uh, Courtney and I like to do. Um, a part of emergency management is, is having this kind of critical look at how you've performed and doing it in a way that you're not married to um, you're not emotionally invested in the in the information and the reason why i say the right information is the right information is because many times we'll have a, a surveyor come into the building and based on our previous uh, experiences not just through covid but with the uh, survey staffs uh, a lot of times we look at the information um, through the lens of us defending um, what we feel maybe we didn't do well um, or defending because we thought we did it correctly and it's really difficult to look at yourself and or actions that you or your staff have taken and gone oh god you know what you're right we do really well at it believe it or not because we go through that survey process every year we have to look at it but i i just want you guys to know that even if it's the information comes from a source that you don't necessarily like. If it's the right information, let's use it. Um, even if I have, um, even if it's looking at myself critically or looking at things that we have done, um, we always try to do that. And so we're, we actively encourage you to tell us how we can do our be job better. And I think as a best practice, when you get these survey staff in the building, how can I, I don't wanna be minimal. I wanna be the best. How can I be the best? And so those are the, that's the information we wanna seek out. Um, and, and that's the information or the, the practices we wanna model. So anyways, with that, let's jump into uh, questions and we'll go, uh, we'll go over if necessary. I hate to cut you guys off. Go ahead, Courtney. Okay, can you hear me all right? I sure can. Okay, so our first question. Um, I realize this is more of a Medicare reimbursement question, but it relates to COVID-19 and the three-day waiver. Judging from the update of the SE 2011 MLN matters, may we use the three-day QHS waiver to cover residents who are considered exposed to a person with COVID? You know, uh that's a, that's a fantastic question. Can you do me a favor, Courtney? Can you copy that all of that text and email that information with the name of the person to uh, Jeff Sandman or or Jennifer Green? I I I would be a, the completely the wrong person to ask, uh, and I I would give you the wrong answer, or I would I wouldn't I wouldn't even know where to start with that. So I appreciate the question. It's a great question, very valid. I want to make sure that the right person gives you the information. So. If you could, if, if your email is not uh, attached to that, can you give us an, an email in the chat box so that Courtney can capture that and we can get you an, uh, an answer to that question. And maybe I can have Jeff post his response to that directly to the forum so folks can see it. Absolutely, right. I can follow up with that and uh, access the, the email. Okay, next question. Which do you suggest is more effective, sanitizing sprays or UV lights to eliminate COVID? I, from my understanding, especially after watching that webinar, is the UV, uh, well, it's UVC specifically. And then um, I guess UVC operates in a, 
a specific spectrum of light that disrupts the, the virus's ability, any virus's ability to replicate itself or to heal itself. And uh, I, I, I butcher the, the specifics, but it was very, very clear from that webinar that the UV light was way more effective uh, than other forms of environmental cleaning. Next question. And I'll just say from, from a oh. personal note, because I have a UVC light that I use in my home, um, make sure that you get one that follows all the safety regulations because if you get a cheap one, they actually um, can off gas uh, certain things. So just make sure you read the fine print on those UVC lights. Okay, next question. If we were to implement a negative air room by venting a fan device to outside, do we have any idea about clearance around the outflow area? For example, we vented a fan or we vent a fan out a window, should we put caution tape around the outside window for a 20 foot radius or or more? I, you know, I Oshwad, I don't know that they would say, you know, you gotta put caution tape on there. I, I'd have to ask, I don't think that would be required, but some kind of visual cue um, to let people know not to walk within the space that you've identified. Uh, and you want to make sure where that's venting is not close to the fresh air intake for any of the other uh, package units you got in the building. So uh, make sure that th that specifically is what you want to make sure. Um, you know, the outside area, you know, just kind of with some visual cues of what represents 20 feet, I think is probably okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get that clarified for sure. But um, the, the real concern is that it's venting and then fresh air from another unit is, is pulling that air in, and that's within the 20 feet, and that's what we're concerned about. Next okay. question. Next question. Is there a lab company that does batch testing where 10 swabs are tested at once, and if positive, then retest the individual, but if negative, then 10 negatives for the price reagent of one test? You know, I have not heard that. Um, I do know that, um, I've heard from other states that are, we're not the only ones that are struggling with testing. It's everywhere in the country, or well, not everywhere, but a lot of places in the country. And we've heard them rolling back all of these testing requirements. And that was one of the things we had heard about as a possible way that they could uh, reduce um, the testing. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I I think, uh, me personally, all the, all the, you know, all the things in the community that you see set up to get the community back in, some of those resources got to be dedicated to SNFs. In no way, shape, or form should we be second to anybody when it comes to testing. We have the most risk. Uh, our folks um, do the worst when they get infected. It's, uh, it's, it's just, I, I would never advocate for us to go less. I would only advocate for better, um, uh, better capacity or larger capacity to get you guys to resources and minimize the operational impacts. But I don't, I don't um, see a time where I would or CAF would recommend that. I just don't think it would be in the residents' best interest. Next question. Uh, are these unannounced surveys specifically directed at inf infection control or COVID? surveys yeah. or are they starting to do their annual surveys? No, this was in, in response to the infection control surveys. Uh, now, I've heard that they're going to start doing the regular surveys pretty soon, but then, uh, you know, you know, we're not in, you know, stage three in, in most counties. And so, you know, where are we at? And I don't, I don't, I haven't heard of that happening. I know it's on the table, but I have not heard of that happening. These ones were referring to or specific to infection control. Next question. Are there any specific guidance from any agency regarding the latest airborne transmission concern? Is there guidance on what filtration devices might be approved for use or regarding use in corridors, et cetera? Yeah, well, those two links that I linked on there, both of them have great resources. The very first one has a really detailed list of uh, uh, they, you know, those five kind of things that they pointed to, they've got a number of recommendations based on a bunch of research and it's all cited down at the bottom. It's from, uh, they pulled research from all over the world, the CDC, a number of other things as it relates to airborne contamination, not just uh, COVID, but, um, 
you know, other, they're drawing parallels to other things like SARS, uh, which is very, very similar. Um, so this stuff is pretty well researched and I would start there. Uh, if you run out of information on how to accomplish this from those, um, like I said, I'm asking Oshpod for guidance. I, I really do think that uh, if we if we do it, they're going to give us uh, um, some kind of official documentation on how they want it done. Uh, but until that time, I think you there's nothing in those recommendations that they put in this on that research that would uh, uh, require us to do an Oshpod permit or anything like that. When we start talking about negative pressure isolation, that's a whole different ball game, and that's going to involve getting Oshpod. Uh, involved or it should i don't want to if you the person who has the negative pressure if you didn't let oshpod know you might want to uh, think about you know preparing uh, your kind of argument on why you set it up and how you set it up and did you follow uh, standard kind of guidance uh, i i've sent out some guidance on um, how to set up those uh, temporary negative pressure isolations there's a couple of guides on the calf disaster prep website as well um, and those were given to me by Oshpod. So if you're following those guidances, even though they're not from Oshpod, they're from, one's from Minnesota and the other one's from Ohio, I think. But it, in any case, if you're following those guidelines, that's what uh, CAF gave to us to give to you guys. All right, next question. Some of the task force labs are contracted or farm out their services to other labs that do not show up on the list. Are we safe to go through contracting with those labs? Yeah, I think so. I, I, th I think we understand that. And I think the lab under or the, the state understands that. The state just, I, you know, I don't know what the process was to vet them. I know that they asked them, you know, uh, uh, can you, what's the level of service you can provide? What's your throughput? How quickly can you do it? We need you to commit to doing them this quickly. We uh, we need you to agree to do the billing all in one, at least for the full service labs. That was the the ask. What that looked like, I don't I don't know, but that's what they've told us that they have required from the from the labs that are on that list. But we understand that some of those labs are third parties. They don't actually have the equipment in house to do it, um, and that's okay as long as they're meeting your your turnaround goals and you're and they're being responsive and they're taking care of the building billing uh, you know as long as they can meet the need i'm happy next question do you know if pool testing will be permitted anytime soon particularly in SNES? Uh, i'm sorry which which kind of testing pool testing um it might be the same as batch testing i i had not seen this one before do you know if pool testing will be permitted anytime yeah. soon particularly oh, cool. in Pool with a P. I thought you said cool with a C. No, yes, pool testing. That's the same. The same uh, theory. I I um, I suppose if it gets really bad, if the testing it, it gets really difficult to come by, we the state could consider that. But that would be a statewide decision, and I I haven't heard them talk about it. Um, we've not mentioned it in any of our calls with CDPH. So. Next question. Uh, that was our last question, so mm -hmm. I'm going to just talk a minute for our CEs and the registration process, and if anyone has any last-minute questions, go ahead and enter it. But I just wanted to say, um, if you want a CE hour for today's webinar, um, so how the registration is currently working is if you register on CAF.org, that means that you will have access to the CE evaluation. Um, you still have to register on GoToWebinar, which if you're on today, I'm assuming you did because you're here. Um, but just know that there's kind of two parts to the registration process to get your CE hour. I'm currently um, in discussion with how we can make that process easier. Um, but again, if at any time anyone has any trouble getting on to the webinar or um, accessing your CE evaluation, please let me know so I can fix that um, as quick as possible for you. And uh, we hope to see you all back next week. I don't see any new questions in the chat box, so we will follow up with that one gentleman about your reimbursement question. Um, but I think that is it for today, Jason. Well, thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. You got this. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.